I want to welcome you all. My name is Eileen Levinson. I am the founder and executive creative director of Hagadot.com and uh, Custom and Craft Jewish Rituals, Inc. And we'll explain what all of these organizations are. And we are joined here with uh, Rebecca Missel, our director of partnerships. I who um, has uh, developed most of the presentation and the ideas that we're going to talk about today. And so um, uh, you all can see my screen, right? Yep. Okay, so uh, Hi Holidays at Home. We're a new project by the team at Hagadot.com, and we had a lot of requests from users earlier this summer to help with the High Holidays because we had a pretty successful Passover season helping you make a your Passover seders at home. So we're taking our knowledge and using it for the high holidays. So what is Hagadot.com? Well, we invite every Jew, regardless of background, to find a place for themselves in the Passover story to create more meaningful, more personal, more connective Passover seders. And we believe that we can use that strategy for just about every holiday. You can make your own Passover Haggadah on the site. You can print it out or view an interactive version, um, just like you see here. And now we're building on this experience for high holidays at home. So you can use this to make your Rosh Hashanah Seder, um, a, an Elul blessing booklet, your uh, Yom Kippur rituals. Think about how to do the high holidays in a way that works for you. Both High Holidays at Home and Hagadot.com are projects of our larger nonprofit, Custom and Craft Jewish Rituals. We are a 501c3. We're a design lab for the Jewish community, experimenting with technology, media and video to imagine new formats for ancient traditions. And all of our programs are available for free. It's very important for us to have this creative content accessible, but we do rely on donations to pay for all aspects of our work. So we hope that if this uh, webinar and our other content is meaningful to you, and if you're able to, we hope you'll consider making a contribution uh, to us. So Rebecca, uh, get us started. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everybody. As Eileen said, my name is Rebecca Missel. I am the Director of Partnerships here at Hagadot.com, and I'm so excited to be uh, sharing this webinar with you today. So what we're going to sort of go through a little bit is about sort of why altars, why now? Talk about choosing a place and making it holy within your home, figuring out ways to make your altar your own so that it, it feels really authentic to you and what you want to have there and then brainstorming and questions uh, we'll get to at the end so we can talk about ideas together. So it is uh, not, just, we, we planned this intentionally. Today is Rosh Chodesh Elul, the first day of the month of Elul, which means Rosh Hashanah is a month away, which is, I know maybe a shock to some of you, uh, but it is true. And I want us to sort of, um, use this opportunity because the idea of altar making may be a little bit different for us, maybe this is a new practice, to get in a bit of a creative mindset. And so with that, I want to invite everybody just to close their eyes and take a deep breath in and out. And I want you, and you can do this with your eyes closed or open, but I think it's easier sometimes to focus with your eyes closed to think about what it is that the high holiday smell like to you. Is it is it freshly baked challah? Maybe it's old books. Maybe it's a lulav and etrog. And think about for a second, what do they feel like? What's what's the texture, the feel in your hands uh, or in your body? Is it your fist beating on your chest? Maybe it's running your fingers through the fringes of your parents' talit as you sit in, in a service. Maybe it's the feeling of throwing crumbs into the water. And now I want you to think about what the high holidays look like. Just visual, what are some of the visuals that you have associated with this time of the year? Maybe it's everybody's wearing white or their best outfits maybe you're in something uncomfortable that your mom made you wear uh maybe that's it's palm branches and fairy lights on the top of your sukkah or it's your grandmother's china or even just the the image of the torah being unscrolled at the part at the front of your of your community and i want you to invite you just to hold those experiences with you and take one more deep breath together. And I want you to sort of think about taking these scents and sights 
and, 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 and sensory and touches and feels in with you as we move into this workshop together. Great. So why, why altars? Why are we even doing this workshop? Uh, so for myself, a lot of the inspiration came from this idea that for many of us living in a pandemic, our homes have already become and have adapted to accommodate so many needs, right? There are office, there are schools, there are gyms, our restaurants, movie theaters. You know, you can put in the chat what else your house has become, maybe a summer camp or something in this time. And now we're inviting you to take just another little corner of that house, the part that isn't already a gym or a restaurant or a school, and make it something spiritual and holy. So what exactly is an altar? So I like to think of an altar as a place where I can focus my attention and my prayers and meditation. Uh, they do, altars do appear in our Jewish text and tradition, and we can, uh, toward the end, we'll, we'll go through some specifics if we want to, if folks have questions around, around these uh, sort of ideas of where altars appear, but they are often built during spontane spontaneously during moments of triumph and challenge, during our wanderings in the desert as we went from Egypt to Israel, right? We, we made sacrifices on an altar before the temple was built. And then after, and there were sacrifices that obviously, and altars that were existed in the temple. After the temple, uh, the rabbis told everybody, okay, we don't have this big place to go to anymore. So we, we're going to make a mikdash ma'at, right? A small sanctuary in our homes. And you may have seen, you know, some versions of these altars uh, before, whether it, it could even be, you know, just the idea of focusing on a mizrah, maybe on the eastern wall of your home, or you've seen it in others' homes, where it, it indicates which wall of the house is east to, to, to sort of turn our bodies and our intentions. There's also, um, if you're aware of, or if you've maybe seen it before, there's a custom of Shibiti plaques, which usually have the name, it will say like the yud heh vav -Hey version of God's name. And it'll have all these intricate scripts and writings of, of different texts. And they're often hung up in synagogues. And again, it's about helping to people focus. And I just wanna like rest, every, rest assured, it is not idolatry. I am not taking you down a path of, 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 of idol worship in the next uh, 45 minutes of this webinar, I promise. So, uh, and to continue with that thought, um, there are uh, sacred spaces that we've had in our homes and our, our tables um, already that can be considered altars. So we are not praying to these objects. We are using these objects to remind us of um, our intentions and what we're grateful for and what we're hoping for. And so, um, Obviously, the, uh, the, the table that we are most familiar with here at Haggadot.com is the Passover table. And I always love in spring, I have many Persian Jewish friends who also like to share images of the Hafsin table for Noruz, which is the Persian New Year. And they incorporate beautiful elements like mirrors, um, rose petals, uh, cardamom tea coins. All of these have a symbolic meaning. And... Um, and I just love seeing the, uh, the play of the Hafsin table and the Passover Seder tables every springtime. And we also have been getting creative with our Seder tables. We have been adding our own symbols. Um, as you can see on the right, we've got a new version of the uh, Seder plate that is in a line, not necessarily a circle and has labeling. Um, and uh, there's a lot of creativity that we're already doing to turn our tables into holy spaces. I would even say that we are creating altars in all forms of Jewish ritual. So I got married uh, under the chuppah last fall and that chuppah was a holy space to us. That's not my wedding picture up there. Um, but this is a beautiful example of a couple that put photographs in there in the tapestry above their chuppah. For me personally, my husband and I searched for a beautiful piece of fabric that by making it in our chuppah, we could also use that as a tablecloth or perhaps for our Rosh Hashanah altar this year, a high holiday altar. Um, I'm also very moved by the tradition of placing stones um, at grave sites. And um, might we consider uh, these also altars? So 
think about the ways that altars can be a holy space to remind us of the ritual and the transformation of the moment. And really in practical matters, if you are gonna go through the um, work of creating a beautiful tablescape or a Rosh Hashanah Seder plate or setup, why not enjoy it for more than one night? And you can enjoy it for all of Elul or perhaps the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, let yourself have fun and bring in your senses. Great. So now comes like the sort of the nitty gritty of, of how, right? How do we actually go about doing this? So, and this is actually, uh, the photo here is actually an image of an altar that I made as sort of a, a test altar uh, in advance of this workshop. So you can see a little bit of, uh, this is honestly on top of my radiator that is currently not making heat in my living room. I live in a small-ish apartment. So I would say there's no place too small. Uh, so you can use bookshelves, tables, TV trays. If you have those old folding TV trays, those are excellent because they can be moved around if you need them to be. Uh, you wanna make sure they're accessible for all family members. Maybe you have people of different heights. Maybe you have a person who's in a wheelchair. And so something that's at your eye level is at, is at another person's not eye, is at another person's knee level. And, and how do you sort of differentiate that? So a bookshelf can be nice because then you can have it on different levels for different family members. You wanna make sure that things are pet safe and toddler safe. So I do not recommend, uh, yeah, kittens do make everything difficult, I would say. Um, I would say, yes, the pets are, I would say even a big, bigger, as big of a concern as the toddlers. Uh, don't put candles and light them unattended on your altar if you have kittens or toddlers around. That's just like good things. A cabinet is a wonderful idea if you need a kitten safe or child safe uh, option. I think that's a great suggestion, Eileen, thank you. Um, so once you've picked out your space, the next step is, is making it holy, right? Is doing that, 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 that intentional task of differentiating it from your office, gym, restaurant, living room space. So I love the idea of putting a cloth on it, like a tablecloth. You can use, you can use a tablecloth, a scarf. I happen to have a lot of scarves around. Other fabric that you just have. While white is a traditional high holiday color, I get things dirty. So I personally have very little white cloth in my house or clothing. Uh, so it can be any color of pattern. Blue is so often a tradition in our community, but you may also want to use uh, fall colors since we are in the Northern hemisphere uh, transitioning. I'm not sure if there's a pro, well, so the question about using a tali is interesting. Uh, I follow now on Instagram, there's a person called the Seder Plate Project and they make like just a plate every month for Rosh Chodesh and they, this uh, for Elul actually did wrap it in a tali. I think it depends on your, your comfort level. Um, but once you've sort of laid the groundwork for it, you want to dedicate this space and make it different. So we love the, the idea of the, using the blessing. This is a blessing that comes from the end of Havdalah that is used to separate Shabbat from the rest of the week. And it is a, it's all about separating the holy and the ordinary. And, but you can use really anything. You can, you can make it, we like to talk about like mezuzah moments that's like a, a kissing of it being over the threshold. You can just put your hands on it and say, this is now my altar space, right? Like it doesn't have to be a specific blessing or anything. It's just, it's whatever you want to do to intentionally separate this from the rest of your home. Right. And also as I want to add in, as we're talking about spaces being holy, um, that does not necessarily mean holy in a, um, a traditional God-like way. Um, we're aware that a lot of people are agnostic or have different ideas of what God may be if they believe in God at all. And, and that's okay. It's uh, thinking about how you are making this space sacred and uh, separate from everything else in your life. Yeah. I love that. I, I totally agree. I think your whole how you define holiness is up to you. It can even just be the holiness of, of people to each other. And I think that that's such a huge thing right now as, you know, as some of us may not be able to see the people who are the most important and sacred to us, that this is a way to honor that, which is, I think, a really good pivot into 
what it is to put onto your altar. Uh, so I love the idea of themes. You can use uh, each of the four elements to that is earth, fire, water, and air. You can represent that through uh, wood or, or plants for earth. You can use um, candles to symbolize fire, water. Some people will put an actual jar uh, or a glass filled with water. You may have a really beautiful glass that you never get to use. I know I do. Uh, and then for air, sometimes people use candles or incense. So we're gonna come back to incense in a minute. Uh, you may also wanna think about different ways of engaging all five senses. So we started with a few of the senses at the beginning, but thinking about sight, sounds, taste, smell, and touch, maybe mixing textures, maybe mixing um, different foods. If you, again, depending on who is in your house and using your altar, different foods, Kittens, I would not recommend leaving too much food out uh, or toddlers, but it depends on what the food is too. Uh, you may wanna use just your favorite color or change it up regularly with different colors if you can't commit to a favorite color. Um, I think it's so important, especially with so many of us staying inside a lot and with uh, the change of the seasons coming to think about what elements of nature can you bring in, so whether it's flowers or plants or leaves that you've collected. Uh, it can be really wonderful. So that's sort of in terms of themes. Uh, and I'd love to hear ideas. Please put any ideas that you have into the chat. We love to, we love to hear everybody else's creativity. As far as objects to include, uh, while this altar doesn't have it, I'm planning for my uh, Rosh Hashanah altar to include photos of my family, particularly my, my, my elder family who has, who have passed, who are no longer with us. You can use favorite books and, and write down or write down some of your favorite quotes and include spiritual text, which could be a Siddur. It could also be the life-changing magic of tidying up. If that is a spiritual text for you, Marie Kondo, great, right? It can be whatever is meaningful for you. Um, holiday cards, if you send, or if your family has a custom of sending high holiday cards, that can be nice. Uh, found objects, like I said, I love the a fish in the fishbowl. It's funny, the fish in, in a bowl, there's a tradition during the half scene, like Eileen mentioned during No Roos, that a goldfish is part of the, of the half scene table. Uh, so I, I love that. Um, coming wishes, yeah. So I think intentions to write on slips of paper and you can place it in a jar or a bowl. If you want to get really witchy, you can always burn them. Uh, uh, I am not specifically avoiding images of mentors. You can use any, but this is your altar. Uh, so these are just my ideas. Uh, I think it's wonderful. If there are people who are really dear to you, absolutely you can use. Oh, I love the broken glass shards from a, from a wedding glass. Those are wonderful. Uh, the other thing that I just, I will sort of say is just a few like notes. One is that your altar can be changed, right? So whether it's, you know, you could change it every few days, every week, but tending to that altar, it doesn't need to be a static thing like, okay, I made it, it it's, it's frozen in ember. No, like this is, these are, these are architectural things that can be really adaptable. Uh, there's ways, so there are ways you can make it certainly to be specifically Jewish by including their Judaic objects. Uh, you'll see on this one here, uh, there's some, can it's kind of hard to see, but there are candlesticks here. Uh, that are traditional Shabbat candlesticks. But again, it's, it is um, as Jewish or as universalist as you want to make it. The other thing I will mention is um, in terms of sensory, there is a trend, particularly for, for people of a certain age, uh, to burn sage. Uh, sage is a really uh, holy plant for a lot of indigenous communities. So if that is something that you have as a custom, Okay, if it is not traditionally your custom and it is not a, a, a practice that you have a, uh, an association with to avoid appropriating from other cultures and maybe consider uh, burning incense, specifically cedar and frankincense, uh, vetiver is wonderful. I think there's a lot of other um, burnable plants that are not appropriate. Thank you, Ari. I, that is a really wonderful way of framing that. So, so just to you know, just to keep that in mind as you're as you're considering what to put on your altar. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And Rebecca, I just want to say, with all of these um, ideas and everyone's great ideas in the chat, it makes me feel like this altar is like the anti-Zoom, right? We're spending <laughs> so much time with our faces in front of the screen that we get to craft this, like this, the textures and the scents and if we are going to eat things, the flavors and, and all of the things that we're not getting from looking at mm -hmm. a screen. So I'm feeling very inspired by this. It's very Jenny awful resisting the attention economy. Like this is completely, doesn't need to be consumerist. You don't need to buy anything for this. You don't need to, you know, maybe you can, you can scavenge or, 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 or you know, forage for things, but this can be totally built on what you have and exactly is, is not a screen based experience. And I, and it is somebody had emailed about it, um, both this webinar and the altar making in general, absolutely. It can be for kids. Um, you know, this can absolutely be a moment to put your kids arts projects up, right? Like this doesn't have to be precious necessarily either. This can be messy and real and chaotic too. It doesn't have to be, so delicate. If you've got little kids at home, it should reflect that there's little kids in your home. Yes. So when do we want to visit our altars? Um, it can be uh, today is Rosh Chodesh Elul. It's a it's a it's a traditional time for reflection, repentance, and connection. So now can be a great time if you want to make an Elul altar, or if you want to have an altar that's a little bit more static. Uh, you can make it now to last you through the holiday season. Somebody had a great idea in here just about um, using traditional Havdalah spices. So usually that's uh, cinnamon and cloves and really like ginger, really fragrant warming spices, which are nice autumnal things. I love my congregation has a custom also with fresh herbs. Uh, rosemary and sage are both really um, here in the Northern Hemisphere are both uh, seasonal right now. And um, right, yes, rather than, right. I feel like there's somehow weirdly, I feel like there's a difference between dried sage and just like sage that I buy in the grocery store. But yes, you can also use mint because uh, mint is pretty universal. We're at the end of summer. So basil, if you have basil plants at home, those are probably shooting up. If you're an Ashkenazi person, you probably grew up with a lot of dill in your home. Uh, I know I, my family's Hungarian, there's a lot of dill involved. Uh, so all of these are, are wonderful ideas. Thank you, Lavender, I always love too. So this idea of why to visit your altar, I think is really important too, because I think what we don't want is to build it and then it's just this thing that exists in a corner over there that we don't really interact with. So uh, you can visit your altar, whether it's to bless each other, bless, your, bless the family that isn't here with you, that is here with you, you can eat your meals there, take the time to meditate, to journal, to do, you know, you, you can come there for all of the things that you may have ordinarily gone to a synagogue for at this time of year. But that those things can happen here in your own little space in your in your home. Uh, it is similar, right, similar to a sukkah, I will also say as a person who lives in an apartment, a sukkah is not an accessible experience for me. So being able to do it uh, in the corner of my living room is really is, is something I really appreciate. Uh, I think it's also a place where you can sing and dance, do art there. Um, I mean, do you want to talk about uh, this wonderful soluble paper? Yeah, so um, on our blog, you can read a little bit more about this. There was a project that I developed uh, several years ago um, where I was asked to create a Tosh Leaf experience. And uh, we're going to do a webinar uh, later uh, in this season on Toshly. Um, but we uh, developed this toolkit where you can take water-soluble paper and write your apologies or your notes of forgiveness on there. And um, this is, I think you can find it on Amazon. It's usually rice paper. Um, and I have a printed template. But it, this is a beautiful thing. Um, also, you might want to consider this in your synagogue because you can uh, set it up outside or set it up in a lobby where people can go in one by one and it's a perfect social distance activity. Um, so this could be a great element to also include in your altar. Uh, I also want to say that we are um, coming up with many ideas and we're going to continue to brainstorm what to include on your altar. Um, an altar can also be very minimal, right? You can have a very clean space, maybe with just one or two objects. 
Um, I tend to like a lot of stuff. You know, I'm a designer, I'm a maker, so I have a lot of stuff in my house. And so for me, my altar might be a space that's a little bit minimal where I can go and sit and, and, and think a little bit more clearly. So, uh, you know, think about what works for you. There was a really good question here, thank you, Joy, about how do we incorporate Zoom in with our, uh, with, with our altar experience. And I think you can, it depends on sort of the architecture of your home, but uh, you can, you know, for me, what I'm planning to do, and we can't quite see it right now, but I am looking over to the corner where I'm planning to have it. So I have my altar set up on top of my currently dormant radiator. And then next to it, I have like a little side table. I might put my computer on the side table to zoom into a service while I'm sitting next to my altar so that I'm sort of getting both of those experiences at once. That is a way to do it. Uh, again, it, it, it's really, this is, um, you could make nature your altar and bring a tablet out and zoom while in nature maybe around a favorite tree too, and, and think about using it that way. So I, I've been reading this book recently uh, by Casper Turkile, who's actually gonna be speaking on a future webinar of ours uh, at the end of at, at late September, and it's called The Power of Ritual. And I love uh, this idea that he shares, but how we transform a routine uh, or another project like vis from visiting our altar into a ritual. And yes, I think Mizbeach can be a word. We use the word altar, I think, really to make it um, a word that people have heard before, but I think that there are many, many Hebrew words uh, for, that, that we can also uh, weave into our experience. But this idea of transforming it into a ritual in three ways, one through intention, to coming to it, not just out of rote, but really with, with, with the kavanah, would be like a Hebrew term in our hearts and intention in our hearts, attention so being focused on it so maybe i'm a terrible multitasker uh which i know is not real you're not supposed to technically be able to multitask but actually focusing your attention on this and repetition so coming more than once so maybe whether that is every shabbat uh every day during the month of elul every day between rosh hashanah and yom kippur however it is that you want it to be. And again, I think so much of this is about making it authentic to our lives and our needs and, and to understand that really, and you know, I, I want to encourage everybody to feel empowered by this experience, um, to create the spiritual experiences that we desire and to nurture ourselves. I think so, I think there's, it's very easy to feel this high holiday season like so much is different, and, the, and, and it is, of course. Uh, and it's easy to feel a sense of loss with that. Uh, and I hope that the idea of exploring this practice is actually you know, opening up for you an opportunity and a, and a sense of empowerment about creating this space for, for a different kind of high holiday experience to happen. Um, I've been sharing, oh, so this is a really good kind of a background to have on your Taurus. I want to... Uh, this artist here um, that we're looking at right now is, his name is Dave Shilkret. He's actually, I'm a member of the community at Lab Shul here in New York, and he was our artist in residence uh, last year for the high holidays. And uh, he creates, this is a tiny little earth altar that he has made, but he makes ones that can be as large as a room. I think the one that we had last year in Manhattan was easily uh, uh, an eight foot by eight foot square and incorporates he incorporates uh feathers and shells and rocks and leaves and flower petals he has a book it is truly beautiful he also has a instagram that you can follow it's all at morning altars and i think that it's just it's important for us to think about you know how how can we weave in nature again i'm i'm really feeling um a desire to reconnect with nature because I live in an apartment in a city and I'm very blessed and lucky to live two blocks from a very well tended park, but that uh, that nature can be really cut off from us and this is an opportunity to bring it back in. Yeah. I'm also thinking Rebecca, um, 
just how important this, this theme of empowerment is for us. I mean, um, for those of you have, who have followed our past work and are going to continue to follow us, uh, empowerment is really what we are all about. And these moments of creating altars, uh, some people might find it, uh, you know, superfluous to Judaism or maybe a little bit as Rebecca and I kind of say woo woo. But what this is doing is this is giving you a sense of ownership of your relationship to Judaism. And uh, another theme for, we, you might choose to have the themes of uh, the high holidays, tefillah, teshuva, and sadaka, and how you might incorporate that into objects at your table. And that's what you need, that, that's what are really, if you ask any rabbi, that's really what's core to the high holidays. And you don't need to be sitting in a frontal experience where you're all watching a rabbi perform for you. Obviously those experiences add value to our Jewish lives. But what we want you to come away with is that that's not the only way to be Jewish and you can have this in your home. Yeah. So there's some really interesting questions here I want to sort of lift up. So this idea of what to have, you know, for those of us who are leading services on the high holidays, um, what kind of background to have. So if you see here, I don't know how much of it you can see, but I actually put up for today here behind me, this is just like a vase of dried flowers and I have my great great grandmother's candlesticks here. Um, it could be that. It could be that you want to hang a tapestry or something behind you. Again, as just, you know, not what I think it's, you know, something that could be meaningful for you. As far as the um, experience of being at an altar versus um, meditating in any other kind of space in a living room without an altar, Again, I have uh, attention span challenges, I will say, uh, just to be very like candid about myself. And so for me, the idea of carving out this other space is, uh, is, really, um, is really helpful in helping me to focus and, and to sort of and to carve out this other in and the intention behind it. Uh, thank you, Janet. Janet just shared about uh, background textiles um, I'm not sure if that's also like, is that a Zoom background thing or is that a, is those physical textiles, Janet? Um, if your computer is advanced enough, you may want to explore also just having a Zoom background. Physical, oh cool, so you can order actual fabric, amazing. Uh, and then, but there is also, uh, you could do a Zoom background, you know, maybe not of the Golden Gate Bridge, but maybe of your congregation or of somewhere in Israel. Um, I agree. I'm not the biggest Zoom background fan and my computer doesn't always work with it, but it, it is again, you know, to, to your discretion. So some other uh, quick tips around uh, gathering your family and, uh, and doing your and having an altar. If you are, uh, if you're doing instead of a uh, Rosh Hashanah Seder in person, maybe you're doing a Seder on Zoom like we talked about a bit uh, in our webinar last week. Um, but you can also come together, especially if you've got littler kids in your family and you don't want to do a whole, you know, half an hour or even hour long Seder together, just coming together for a 10 to 15 minute uh, time to put some things on an altar together and say one quick bracha or one quick sort of wish for the new year together, that's a wonderful way if you've got little kids that, that may be uh, difficult to, to wrangle for an extended period of time on a screen. It can be a great way uh, to, to bring them together. We would love to invite you to take photos of your altar and either share them on highholidaysathome.com, which is our brand new website. Uh, and we would love to have your photos there and you can make it public so that other folks can incorporate them into their uh, high holiday experiences. You can also tag on social media home altars. I will say, if you search for that, you'll see a lot of crosses, but it's okay, those are altars too. Uh, altars transcend other religions, so we'd love to get other al home altars that are uh, representing a wider swath of traditions. And if you do do that, please tag us at uh, Custom and Craft or at Hagadot. And just to invite everybody to, uh, to enjoy, whether it's a Rosh Hashanah meal, if, you're, if you do set up your dining room table as where you put your altar, or to enjoy other high holiday events uh, there as well. 
And uh, we included this slide because we want you to know that we are basing all of this on text. And if, as Jews love to uh, disagree and argue, if you make an altar and somebody says, well, that's not Jewish, here are your resources uh, <laughs> that you can use to say, well, yes, it is Jewish. But by the way, if you are Jewish and if you, de uh, if you um, define yourself as a Jew and you make an altar, it is a Jewish altar. That's my opinion. Yeah. Agreed. So um, we also want to let you know about our upcoming webinars. Uh, next Wednesday, we are having, oh yes, and we are sharing all of this. We put our video and all the slides um, up on our blog afterwards and we'll also uh, email to the participants. So next Wednesday, we have a great writing workshop with Alden Salovey. And that is going to be really useful if you are thinking about um, making your own Rosh Hashanah Seder or Yom Kippur rituals, or if you're thinking about more ways to empower, empower yourself to make these holidays your own, I highly recommend that workshop. Uh, for those of you with little ones in your life, um, we are doing a webinar with PJ Library uh, where they are going to talk about their resources. We're going to talk about our resources through the lens of um, kid-friendly activities. Um, I'm going to be sharing more of our Toshley project on September 10th. We have another writing workshop with Trisha Arlen, also fantastic um, uh, writing with her. And as Rebecca mentioned, creating a ritual life planner with Casper Terkyle. He is amazing. I highly recommend that. So some resources for you. Um, HighHolidaysAtHome.com. We just launched it. We have a ton of resources on there, different options for structuring your Rosh Hashanah Seder and all of your Elul activities. We also just uh, launched a new booklet for Elul and the High Holidays um, with beautiful drawings by Jessica Tamar Deutsch. So you can download that. Uh, if you want more inspiration for making your tablescapes and your altars, follow us on Pinterest. We've got a ton more images there. You can also join our Hagadot.com Seder Planners group where we've got um, a number of uh, members of our community who are sharing their own tips. Um, we love the art of gathering. We, uh, it, it guides much of our work. And um, start with why. I recommend this for when you're planning a Seder. But that's going to help you think about why you're celebrating these high holidays. And once you've figured out why, then you can make all of your uh, design choices regarding your Seder or your altar or even your menu around that. And with that, um, we're just open for questions and yeah. brainstorming. You can unmute if you'd like, or you can put it into the chat. or use the raise hand feature is always also a good option for questions. And I also wanna tell you um, with highholidaysathome.com, we have a lot of original artwork that we've created. Um, we have a Jewish blessing for the home. We have blessings for nature. We have a secular, uh, secular Shema, secular blessings, as well as the traditional Hebrew blessings. So um, all of that is available for download and printing. And we also ask that if there is something uh, really exciting and new that you've come across or if you've written anything on your own, uh, please feel free to upload it to the site and let us know so we can share it. I mean, we want to make a community that is sharing and being creative together. Any other questions that, uh, or ideas that we can troubleshoot or more ideas of uh, ways to make uh, this altar feel Jewish? Jewish artists besides day that make altars? That is a really good question. Um, uh, so I'll put in the Seder plate one. Let me figure out what the uh, Instagram handle yeah. is. Thanks, Kashira. Yeah, Kohenet folks. Yes, and yes. Becca Star. And Becca Star actually has a booklet on her site of Hamsas. Um, you can download her illustration, her illustrated Hamsas and color those in and put it at your um, altar. Um, that's a great question though. Um, I actually, my background is in design and art and installations. And so I'd be happy to share more resources as I think of them about artists who are doing interactive sacred spaces um, to give us all inspiration. Um, any particular stock photo service for Judea content? Um, that is a tough one. We personally use Adobe stock. Um, I think some people use Pixlr. 
Um, I am also happy to, because I know that there is a real lack of high quality, uh, tasteful uh, Jewish photos, uh, feel free to email us with your request for anything that you're specifically looking for. And because I'm sure that if you're looking for it, other people are, so maybe we can um, get the rights to be able to post on the site or even uh, hire an artist to, take, to make them ourselves. Are there synagogues sending anything out to their congregation? That's a great question. Our sense, you know, Rebecca and I are, are in a group called Dreaming Up the High Holidays, and it sounds like every synagogue is doing that differently. Rebecca, what do you see? Yeah. I've been seeing a mix. I've seen some synagogues that are sending out honey sticks and a picture of the synagogue to use uh, if people do want to hang it up in their homes. Uh, I've seen some synagogue or jars of honey and apples. I've seen some debating if they're gonna send out a breakfast kit with uh, juice boxes and things, high holiday. So Janet, do, Janet, do you wanna put in there what's going into your high holiday participation bags? Oh, a booklet, wonderful. And the Russia, yes. So the, the sense is, Danita, I would say yes. I would say a, a chunk of the synagogues I've seen. I think it probably depends on the size of your congregation. Uh, I think it, it can be a really good way to engage with folks. And I would say to think about ways that that relationship can be reciprocal. So not just you as a congregation sending things out to your people, but how are, what are your people giving back to the community and giving to each other? Yeah, and, and also Joy, um, I'm very interested in the booklet that you're creating. And um, send it, once it's uh, complete, if you're comfortable, send the digital file along and we can share parts of it with a larger community. I think what we're seeing now is a real creative explosion happening all around the Jewish world where everybody's tackling this unique time differently. And so our hope is that we can provide um, a database of sorts or a, a collective sharing where we can take what's happening in your community and, um, and elevate your work to others. Um, I also want to say that um, on Custom and Craft, we do have a store. Um, we have some products that are available for order. Um, I don't often promote it because it's a very small part of what we do, but if you go to store.customandcraft.org, um, there are some printed items that you can order. Um, we have a third party vendor that prints and ships things for us, so, but I think it only takes about a week or so for, for everything to arrive. And again, if you have requests for things for us to make, send it along, because we just we just love making new things. Yeah. I want to be in Deborah's congregation. They give out local hard apple cider. Yes. Uh, that sounds fun. Uh, Kashira had a wonderful idea uh, about just sharing. It could be an image that your congregation emails. If it is, if mailing is prohibitive or difficult, that it could be just a beautiful image for everybody to have in their homes, whether in their homes, on the altar, in a sukkah. Uh, Virginia weaves together a number of different traditions with the Dia de los Muertos, um, ofrenda altar, I love that. I come from Arizona originally, so ofrendas are a big part of, of my sort of cultural background as well. Um, right, to create images on the Western wall or, ooh, a coloring book shiviti, I love that. That is a fun idea or a Shibiti making workshop. These are these are great ideas, everyone. Um, yeah, Joy, if you could send us information on that workshop, uh, we would love, if, if it's open, we'd, I know I would love to attend. <laughs> yeah, these are really great. We'll be also, I'm gonna save this chat. So everybody who also attends, we'll, we'll, make, a, we'll make a blog post from the chat uh, like we did last week. Because uh, there is just so much generative ideas. Ooh, talking more about the rice paper. That's an Eileen question. Yes. Okay. So um, I'm going to be writing more about this on the blog in the next couple of weeks with uh, clear instructions. Um, but if, on Amazon, you should be able to order water soluble rice paper. And there are some that you could even put into a laser printer. Um, I know years ago when I did this and I uh, was working at a corporate job, I used to take, I used to put these in the office printer and print them. Um, I would also recommend that you do um, use pens that are edible, non-toxic, um, because uh, what you're, you're taking all of this organic material that can, um, as it dissolves, it can go down the drain or it can go, you could, oh, a beautiful idea somebody had in a previous workshop is 
as you take these uh, water-soluble papers and write on them, and you put them in a bowl, they're going to dissolve. It's going to make kind of a, a little bit of like a, a water rice sludge. Um, but you can always pour that in your garden too. And then, you know, that's going to grow, uh, you know, that'll, that'll help uh, with your plants. I like that it's under spy products. It is. It, it's great. It is. It's great. Yeah, right. that was a great point. So you can feel really, really uh, exciting. It can be like your own personal episode of The Americans for your Tosh Lee. Um, so there's a uh, wonderful, so people are, ooh, eucalyptus bark with beet juice. Loving it. Uh, Sarah Chandler coming through with some wonderful ideas about um, the authenticity of using feathers in Jewish ritual, that there is this idea that the tzitzit are like the wings of your garment, so that to think of tzitzit like feathers, so if you um, don't have uh, a, a water, uh, if, you don't, if you don't have a tali tandy, you can do that. Morris Barzilai, I think you can unmute yourself. Yes, go for it. Hey, hi. Um in terms of uh, when people can use an altar, uh, I'm a rabbi in our synagogue. We're trying to help people promote this. And one of the ideas is how to make the Zoom experience during the services kind of not just like any other Zoom experience where people are feel like they're walking away or, you know, it's like, oh, I'm in my living room, you know trying to emphasize. So one of the workshops that suggested, even if you don't have a permanent altar, so to speak, to encourage people to create a different space uh, uh, or some of these items for during the services to, to remind them that, uh, to remind them that uh, they're in a sacred space and that, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that they're at a sacred moment so that the Zoom, like you say, I, I don't see maybe this is the anti-Zoom. I think this complements the Zoom if, it's, if, if it can be done right. Mm -hmm. I, I, if people aren't into having it as a permanent thing for the entire month from uh, there, I think encouraging that even is a, is a, is a powerful thing uh, that incorporates both the home experience with the community experience. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Uh, somebody asked about symbolic Seder plate foods. or um, So there is a Sephardi and Mizrahi custom. I'm going to put a link in the chat of having, it's called Simanim. They are uh, these traditional foods that have wishes associated with them. And uh, you can, so I, I shared uh, in the chat, it's a link, it's actually a coloring page. Uh, from our holiday, brand new, hot off the press, Seeker, um, the Seeker Season Guidebook. And it's in our Rosh Hashanah Seder with a bunch of symbolic foods. Uh, there's a lot of things, uh, as somebody mentioned, dates and pomegranates, anything round. Uh, people eat squash or pumpkin, leeks are traditional. Uh, there's all different kinds of, of, of fruits and foods. Uh, and so I think somebody mentioned way, way, way back in the chat, this idea of a head, because Rosh Hashanah means like the head of the year. Traditionally, people would eat a lamb or a fish's head. We like the idea of a head of lettuce is maybe a little bit more everybody friendly head option. I have also seen uh, gummy fish, which depending on your level of kashrut may or may not be as accessible. Uh, and depending on who your audience is may or may not be uh, received well, but uh, Head of lettuce is a pretty, pretty easily easy to find thing that is uh, vegan and celiac and everything else and lactose friendly. Um, so that is also an option there. And yeah, I would say there is a couple of different sources on the site around traditional foods. I would think also just about you know a cornucopia, right? Like we have an American Thanksgiving tradition. A cornucopia is it's also its own form of an altar. Yeah, an offering. These are, you know, we're in a harvest time of the year. So depending on where you live, those fruits and vegetables may look a little bit different in California than in New Jersey, than in Florida. But to go to your farmer's market and look and see what's fresh and what's coming into season right now, and that can help guide you as well in terms of what, what fruits and vegetables to include in your altar. Can I unmute myself for a minute? Go for it. Oh, what? Our ritual committee, committee 
committee was meeting this morning and we were just discussing that Seder plate and how to incorporate that in the era of Rosh Hashanah service. And I was just wondering if those were the same vegetables and fruits. And it sounds like it is. Yeah, that's, yeah. Go ahead. I think the main thing for the Seder plate is there are some traditional Sephardi simanim. Yes. Uh, but I really encourage you to choose uh, symbolic foods that makes the most sense for you because, um, you know, if, if so many of the food based puns are based in Hebrew, and if you're doing, if you're going to be um, hosting a Seder with Jews who, for the most part, don't know what they mean, um, I think it's just much more powerful to, to choose foods where the, the symbolism is a little bit more clear. Right. Okay. Uh, somebody else shared in the chat a really a, a good repurposing idea that um, many folks who live in, in larger Jewish communities might get those uh, decorative Jewish calendars that they arrive unbidden from the local mortuary but they often have really lovely pictures in them. And so to consider hanging those there, I think that's also a really a great idea. I wanna say also, there are some really amazing younger uh, Jewish organizations that are doing uh, calendars. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's one that's called like the Radical Jewish Calendar. Yeah, And yeah. the design is fantastic. Um, At The Well, which is uh, an organization that does women's health and Rosh Kodesh groups, I think they also have a Jewish calendar. Um, I personally have a little bit of nostalgia for like these, those old calendars that would come in for the fundraisers that my parents would have. Um, but these new ones just feel like a lot more uh, meaningful and inspirational. There's that Radical Jewish Calendars website. It's really, it's really cool stuff. Yeah. And I saw the question about the, the pens. I'm going to follow up um, as we, uh, I'm going to give some recommendations for the rice paper and the pens and, and step by step. So we'll email that out when it's ready. I think that the pens are actually used for like baking and decorating cakes. Um, that, that's why they're not toxic. Any other uh, questions before we wrap up? Feel free to keep sending us uh, emails and requests as we're just getting started here with the high holidays. So I'm sure there's just going to be so much that's coming up in the next uh, couple months for all of us. And uh, my recommendation is to just uh, remember to enjoy this time. Uh, wow. I know we're all feeling a lot of different emotions right now, but um, this is a time where we can really be good to ourselves. Thank you. So for all of you who have been on a webinar with us before uh, or will be with us in the future, you'll know that we do a closing ritual. And during Passover, we would put our hands in the center and on the count of three, yell Seder. Um, so this time we're gonna yell Shana Tova, just like if we were at like a, a sports game and about to, to play the game. So hands in and on the count of three, we're going to yell uh, Shana Tova. One. One. Two, three. Shana Shana Tova. Tova. Thank you, right, everyone. Thank you. See you soon. Kodesh thank you. This was thank wonderful. You. Thank you. I think the best webinar I've been on. Oh, oh great. And thank I've been on a lot of them lately. <laughs> Good. <laughs> That's really beautiful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We need help. So this is great. Happy to be there. Thank you.